Hey everybody, welcome to another Rollback. Today we're rolling back the clock all the way to May of 2015 to discuss our misplaced obsession with a little macronutrient you might have heard of called protein, and we're doing it with Dr. Garth Davis. Dr. Davis is a veteran weight loss surgeon and obesity medicine specialist who, after years and years of practicing medicine with no real serious education surrounding nutrition, takes it upon himself to determine exactly why so many people are plagued by obesity. It's a quest that led him to identify the ultimate human diet to maximize health. What is that diet? I'm sure you can guess it's a plant-based diet. Dr. Davis is also the author of Proteinaholic, which deconstructs our misplaced obsession with protein and makes the case for embracing our inner herbivore for not only maintaining our weight, but also for achieving maximum health and even optimal athletic prowess. In this episode, recorded in the pre-video days of the show, we cover high-fat, low-carb diets, we cover bad science and how to separate nutritional fact from popular fiction. I sincerely hope you enjoy it and get something out of it. So here we go. This is me and Dr. Garth Davis. First time we went into, uh, you know, all about kind of like your your story and, and, and your ev evolution into what you do. And for listeners that, that want to kind of probe that in more depth, they can go back and listen to that episode. I'll put the link up in the show notes. But I kind of wanted today to um, delve into a couple issues with more specificity sure. <laughs> and detail if we could. Sure. Um, e over the last couple of weeks... I've been a guest on like a bazillion podcasts because, you know, trying to get the book out and doing all these interviews and, and, and the like. And I just did one the other day and the guy kind of, you know, basically like a paleo slant podcast. And the guy <laughs> kind of it, with a smile on his face ambushed me a little bit. You know, he had spent a whole day preparing for the interview and he got, he had all these studies in front of him and it was a Skype call. And he's like, well, what about this study? And what about that study? And I, I felt completely ill-equipped to respond spontaneously in the moment because I didn't have all my, you know, counterpoint studies in front of me. Sure. And, and I felt like a little bit like, not unprepared, but a little bit like, I guess ambushed is, sure, is the sure. best. Is that's the best that's way what they're their modus. Yeah, and so I, I got off the I got off the call and I was like, I just didn't feel that great about it, you know. And it's like I'm not a guy who's spending all my time mired in the research and reading all these studies like you are. So I thought it would be a good opportunity to kind of delve into that a little bit. And I just got an email that I wanted to read that came in from a follower, uh, this guy Alex, and he said. Uh, Hey, Rich, I really enjoy your podcasts. I've been roughly following the Bulletproof Diet for years now and appreciate the critical analysis of some of the new high-fat, high-meat trends. However, I'm not convinced that these are misguided. In reference to your discussion with Joel Kahn, and there's a hyperlink to something, um, blah, blah, blah. Much of the data Kahn cited seemed to be correlational as well, and his discussion seemed to involve a, method, a methodological critique of the profat studies, co-founding variables, reliable subjects, et cetera, not granted to the anti-fat research. The discussion was very level-headed and reasonable, but, and I'm referencing myself here too, it seems very difficult to get away from the quote, my team versus yours, unquote mentality. Beyond the advice to stop eating Twinkies and playing StarCraft, it doesn't quite seem like a quote, objective roadmap exists for nutritional choices. <laughs> And I think, you know, it's a fair, it's, it's a fair observation for him to make. And I think we are in this kind of scenario where there's teams, you know, beating up on each other. And, and, you know, I'm always trying to just get to the objective truth. Like I'm much less interested in being a member of a team right. than truly having a, an in-depth comprehensive understanding of the nutritional landscape when it comes to plant-based, paleo, ketosis, low fat, high fat, you know, all these sorts of ideas that are floating around right now with varying degrees of popularity. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm, I, the, the modus out there right now, you got to understand a few things about science. First of all... Maybe pull your mic up a little bit closer to you. Sorry about that. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, it's better. It's a little echoey. 
Um, the, the first thing you understand about science, there's all kinds of researchers out there, and they live in this world of publish or perish. That's their job. If they don't publish, they get fired. And because of that, there is a lot of really bad research that comes out, a lot of it that's very sloppily done. There is a journal for every kind of thought process you could have, um, you know, a lot of these journals are, are, are really poorly done. They're not well peer-reviewed. And yet what happens in this day and age in these arguments about nutrition is someone will be, um, they'll be like, okay, Rich Roll said this. I'm going to prove him wrong. I'm going to go on to PubMed and I'm going to find an article. First article comes up, that's the article that they use. Mm -hmm. They never read the full article. They don't have a statistics background, so they don't know how to analyze statistics. They don't know the people that are publishing it. They don't know the confounding factors that may have been involved. And yet they use it as fact. And so what, what happens is they pigeonhole you saying, well, you say this, but I've got an article that says that. And it makes those two articles seem equal when, mm -hmm. in fact, they're not. And when you say, well, your article's wrong, they say, oh, now you're just jumping from one thing to the other. I call these guys denialists, all right? And so denialists do several things. First of all, they try to take down authority. So I hear people all the time saying, oh, Dean Ornish, you know, Dean Ornish has been debunked. What, <laughs> what do you mean Dean Ornish has right. been debunked? Right, well, the, the, the cousin to that is the China study has been debunked. Yeah, China That gets thrown around like, like crazy. Right. Right, I, I, look, and if you say it hasn't, then you're an insane person. Yeah, you're an insane person. <laughs> I, 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 and, and look, I could actually there there are things with the China study that I can um, find fault with, but Tino and definitely not. But this idea that even if you found fault with some parts of the China study, Colin Campbell spent his whole life studying nutrition. He's done benchtop research. He's done randomized controlled trial research, and he's done really huge epidemiologic research. You should at least respect his opinion. This idea that he's been debunked is absolutely mm -hmm. ridiculous. Uh, the other thing that they, they tend to do is that you will hear them say this all the time, correlation does not equal causation. And this is true. Like, for instance, uh, there's more chocolate eaten in Switzerland, and Switzerland has more Nobel Prize winners. So somehow chocolate related. <laughs> right. Now, that is called a univariate analysis, meaning you're just taking two variables, and that's the only kind of thing that you're going to measure. It's chocolate and it's Nobel Prizes. To do a scientific study, though, we do what's called multivariate regression analysis, meaning we find everything that could possibly be a confounding factor, you know, um, and we remove that out of the study so that there's no confounding factor so that if we get a statistical significance, it, it may not mean causation, but where there's smoke, there's fire. Mm -hmm. And then if you take Huge numbers of people studying the many years in many different countries, and you start doing these retro, these um, multivariate um, analyses on them, and you come up with the same answer in all these different studies, you better start listening to that. It's really good science. Mm -hmm. The last thing that these people do is they, they try to hold up that the only, without a doubt, the best study you could do on someone is a randomized, controlled, uh, placebo, blinded study. But you can't do that with food. Right. You know, I can't, I can't do a study where I'm going to follow 20 people for 20 years on, uh, you know, three different diets. It's just not going to happen. People don't, uh, people don't live their lives like that. And, no. <laughs> and, and, and they don't just eat one thing. Right. And they all have, you know, varying degrees of, of the way in which they live their life brings up, a, you know, a bazillion variables that you couldn't possibly begin to account for. I mean, so many variables. Look at there's, um, you know, uh, I, I often refer to the EPIC trials, which is one of the largest studies ever done on nutrition, uh, much bigger than China study or any of that. And what they looked at is 500,000 people over, I think, 10 to 12 countries in Europe. Uh, they followed it now 12 to 14 years, and they're looking at different correlations between what you eat, how much of it you eat, and disease processes that you get. And, and the the extent to which they go to eliminate confounding factors is incredible. Um, but they're still, like, they, they've got vegans that they look at, vegans that are in Oxford. But those vegans aren't necessarily healthy vegans. Like, you look at those mm -hmm. vegans, and they're only eating 18 grams of fiber a day. How does an e vegan only get 18 grams of fiber mm -hmm. a day? So, And they weren't eating their B12. So there's so many variables that it's very hard to say vegan is a good diet or a bad diet based on, on these. It, they, but... There is what people miss is there's a huge, huge literature about plant-based diets and about eating meat, and 
a person who's experienced in reading this literature, understanding it, can make pretty good conclusions. And uh, it is not as relative as people make it out to be. Mm -hmm. So what would be, in the most general sense, some of those conclusions based on the studies and the research that you've kind of immersed yourself in? Oh, yeah. Um, Without a doubt, processed meat is horrible for you. you. You can't get away from that fact. So processed meat, bacon... Um, you know, the Subway sandwich, uh, you know, cold cuts, horrible for you. Related with diabetes, cancer, life expectancy, heart disease, horrible for you. Red meat, um, for the most part, looks like it is not good for you. Uh, definitely associated with diabetes. Definitely associated with diabetes. I, mm-hmm. I'm not quite sure you could be vegan and be diabetic. I know there's about a 2% uh, incidence of this, but I don't understand it. I like to see those people more clearly. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's a lot of studies that go on with that. Um, Animal products in general uh, seem to be leading to premature aging in many of the studies. Definitely a link with cancer. Different meats with different cancers. For for instance, chicken is strongly related with um, um, lymphoma and leukemia, whereas meat is strongly related with colon cancers and uh, and some of the other reproductive cancers. Um, Prostate is very, very strongly linked with dairy, eggs, and uh, meat. Um, Definitely a heavy animal protein diet is associated with heart disease. Definitely is associated with high blood pressure. And it's definitely associated with a shorter length of life. And the interesting thing about the longevity studies is we talked about taking out confounding factors if you take out a lot of confounding factors, you get to the point where you're almost taking away a correlation. And yet, after really rigorous statistical analysis, there's still a finding that if you eat a plant-based diet or if you eat less meat, you live longer. Hmm, interesting. Well, I mean, those are some pretty you know, bold statements that fly in the face of what seems to be quite popular right now, which mm-hmm. is, you know, we can go through them, you know, in, in a bullet point way, but why don't we just start with saturated fat, right? There's this sort of populist notion at the moment, um, backed by certain studies that basically says everything you ever heard about saturated fat is wrong. Saturated fat is not your enemy and it's not linked to the incidence of heart disease. Is that a fair characterization of kind of it's where like, a certain school of thought is coming from? Actually, right now? the school of thought has gone worse. They now say saturated fat is good for you, right? So you'll, you'll see the things, you know, bacon is good. And they're not, the funny how <laughs> I saw an article, bacon is good for you. And it wasn't about any testing of bacon being good for you. It was about saturated fat being good for you. Now, the studies that you mentioned that um, called to question saturated fat, um, they never said saturated fat is good for you. That's not their comma. They questioned whether it was as strongly correlated with heart disease as we previously thought. Now, the main study, a study called Siri Torino, is a perfect example of over-adjusting your statistical analysis. Keep in mind, every author on that article was paid for or receives payment from either meat, meat, milk, or dairy. Mm -hmm. What's that study called? It's the Siri Torino study, Mm -hmm. S-I-R-I-T-A-R-I-N-O. That is the study that really started it all. That's the study that all these, you know, journalists like Tobbs and... um, uh, the other one in Gary New York Thomas. Times. Yeah, that's the one they just jumped on mm-hmm. and, and went with it. And was that the basis of the Time Magazine Butter is Back article? Absolutely, yeah. It's the, it's the basis of every article they, that ever comes out. And so what did that study say? So it, they, they looked at a, a bunch of studies, and they said um, basically that saturated fat is not correlated with heart disease. But here's the problem. First of all... You, you hear this term thrown around a lot called cherry picking, where they cherry picked articles that would basically give their answer. Because I could have done that same study and brought a whole different group of articles and gotten a completely different st- uh, analysis. Mm-hmm. But we'll put cherry picking aside. The problem is a lot of the studies that they picked did something called over adjustment. So what they did, it's just like we talked about before. If we're going to do a study and we're going to remove confounding variables, meaning variables that might affect Uh, independently affect the result. So we're trying to see if saturated fat causes heart disease. So we want to take out other things that may affect heart disease. So for instance, if you're diabetic, we're taking you out. You're not in the study. Mm -hmm. And we'll look at our population. We'll say, well, if you're morbidly obese, we know that independently affects that. So we're going to take you out. 
Now, funny, the, the more you take out, the more you're taking out away from people that, you know, uh, like plant-based diet benefits and stuff like that. But here's the key. They took out people that had high cholesterol because high cholesterol is an independent cause of heart disease. But saturated fat causes heart disease by raising cholesterol in part. So by removing those people from there, you're removing the people that actually are affected by the saturated fat. You're leaving for the study people that have a genetic predisposition where they could eat saturated fat, not raise their cholesterol, and therefore won't get heart disease. Mm -hmm. It's it's ridiculous. Now, the second study that came along was a a study by Chowdhury, and um, it was in, I think it was in the British Journal of uh, Medicine. Um, And that study did the same kind of things as the Siri Torino study did, but on top of it, there were people that were on Lipitor while doing the study. So they're taking a drug that's supposed to get rid of the effects of saturated fat, and then they're eating saturated fat and not getting heart disease. But that wasn't taken into account? No. Nope. Into the, that's interesting. Yeah. So, all right, so then that begs the question of the impact of cholesterol on heart disease, and I, and I guess that means you have to talk about the difference between... Um, you know, sort of serum cholesterol and dietary cholesterol, right? The, the yeah. difference between eating cholesterol-laden foods and the impact of that on cholesterol and what that causes in terms of health. Yeah, I mean, eating cholesterol does raise cholesterol. The only place we get cholesterol is from animal products. Um, and cholesterol definitely is associated with heart disease. Now, the problem is we've gotten a little bit more scientific nowadays so that we don't just look at cholesterol per se. However, the largest study that's been done looking at cholesterol in America in a population was the Framingham study. And Dr. Castelli himself said that possibly the problem we have is that we set what we call a normal cholesterol too high Mm -hmm. and that a normal cholesterol should actually be lower. And he noted that under a total cholesterol of 150, they never, in all the years they studied Framingham, saw anybody with heart disease. He said, if you keep your total cholesterol under 150, you're not going to get heart disease. Mm -hmm. We're more specific now. When I see someone with a high cholesterol, I want to know their LDL particle size, their ApoB protein. I mean, there's there's a specific type of cholesterol that's dangerous. And if you have that specific type of cholesterol, that needs to be addressed. Then you need to be on, you know... Seriously low fat. And, low and, and what is the uh, impact of ingesting cholesterol, dietary cholesterol, on your cholesterol levels? Because isn't part of this idea or this argument that, that dietary cholesterol is not impactful on those cholesterol levels? <laughs> yeah, and it's, uh, it's just silly. Um, it, it, without a doubt, if you eat cholesterol. But, but here's the problem, and it's a big problem with our nutrition in general. We get down into what's called reductionist food science. We try to take you know, one part of a food away. It's like, nothing bothers me more than when I'm ordering a salad and the waiter says, would you like a protein with that salad? Mm -hmm. Because I, and then I always, yeah, I always have to pick (laughs) on them and, you know, don't, (laughs) poor guy had to get me at the table. And, you know, then I'm always like, well, you know, what do you mean? He's like, well, do you want chicken or steak? And I'm like, well, there's more calories from fat and chicken. So are you really just asking me if I want some fat with my salad? Yeah. (laughs) And the guy's like, uh, I, you know. Um, You're going to get into a nutrition debate with the waiter. Right, exactly. You know? But I think it's interesting that now I have noticed that they'll say, you know, what would you like for your protein as opposed to what meat? You know, like yeah, that's yeah. a weird vernacular shift that that's didn't right. exist a couple of years ago. Absolutely. My son got into a debate at Chipotle the other day when they, he was, they were going down the line and building the burrito. And the guy says, um, what would you like for, for meat? And Tyler said, I don't, I'm not going to have meat. And, uh, <laughs> and he's like, but I'll have, uh, I'll have this sofritas, which is the, basically their meat yeah, analog, tofu thing, yeah. tofu thing. And, uh, and he's like, well, that's meat. And Tyler's like, no, that's not meat. And he's like, yeah, that's meat. And I'm like, come on, let's just keep moving. Like, this is not going to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to teach this guy yeah. right here. Yeah. But, but the point being, you know, that we're in this reductionist food science where we try to, we're trying to tease away parts of food that stick together. So there's no time that you're ever going to just eat cholesterol. You know, the cholesterol is always going to be tied with fat. Mm-hmm. You know, it's part of the fat. Um, and so it's very hard to measure. The same with just, you know, I, for years I tried to sift through studies looking at animal protein, but it, it's really hard to sift the fact that, you know, animal protein's got saturated fat connected to it and has cholesterol connected to it. So is it the cholesterol? Is it the saturated fat? Is it the animal protein? We can make some judgment as to what it is. 
but really, it's the whole package. And really, we should be talking about the whole package. I mean, the studies would be a lot easier if the study just looked at, you know, meat and mm-hmm. stopped talking about saturated fat. And right, because if somebody says, well, I need that animal protein, well, that comes with a lot of other things right. that, that don't get looked at. And it's tricky because, you know, the reductionist approach is inherently flawed in that regard, as you pointed out. But right there really isn't a better way to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so what else are you supposed to do? Otherwise, you'll get lost in a morass of, of data that's meaningless. Yeah, it's, you know, I, the, the, there's been a change in the actual science. And when I say actual science, everybody's online reading nonsense, okay? They're not reading the actual journals. You know, when they debate with you, their reference is another person's blog, uh, which always makes me laugh. Um, in fact, one guy was like, oh, yeah, this art, he put up an article that was actually against what he was saying, but people don't know how to read the science. Okay, so when, when you actually read the science, there's been a move now in a lot of these big epidemiologic studies to not try to tease away saturated fat or, or any of that stuff and just look at what are the quintiles and of meat consumption. In other mm-hmm. words, there's the lowest quintile, the second quintile, third quintile, fourth, fifth, and let's compare them together and see if we see a change. Mm-hmm. And so, in the stu- like, what are the studies that that you look at and and find most, um, you know, objective and informative and instructional with respect to how you um, devise your treatment protocols for your patients? Sure. And, and someone asked me this once before, a, a paleo guy, and he said because I was complaining about, and there's so much of this the involvement of industry and in science. Because the industry, they know, just like with tobacco, if they could put a seed of doubt in someone's mind, they can make them say, well, I don't know if meat's good. I don't know if it's bad, so I'm going to eat it. Right. And the that's confusion what confusion plays into their hands. Confusion is exactly what they want. And so they love this confusion going on. And so I don't like these bias in a lot of the articles. So if I read an article and I see that there's bias in it, that immediately doesn't discredit the article, but, you know, raises eyebrows. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's not the data that they're doing that's bad. It's the interpretation that the people read. So I'll go through the data, you know, and look at the charts and stuff and say, well, you know, their conclusion is not exactly what I read. I'll give you an example of that later. Um, But so someone said to me, well, they might have bias, but don't you have your own bias? I mean, aren't you vegan? And I had to think about that for a while because, yeah, I, I am biased in that regard, I'm worried about the environment. I'm worried about the senseless slaughter of animals for no reason or, uh, or, or the way they're killed. But there's two sides to me, I really think. Like if, if, we came, if an article came out and said there's no benefit to a plant-based diet whatsoever, I would stop recommending that to patients, and I didn't recommend it until I got the science. Mm-hmm. And I would be vegan and say, look, don't kill animals because it's mean to kill animals. That's, I started this without the vegans component of it. I started this based on, on, on pure health. And as the more and more I've learned, I've really, really started looking at the health. And what really convinced me were several studies. So the, there, there's, the, the EPIC study I talked about is as unbiased as possible. I mean, this is really a conglomerate of the European Union. These are some of the top epidemiological scientists. That if you read a paper, there's like 100 authors for each paper. Mm-hmm. They looked at their food questionnaires that they used. They made sure that they were culture-specific. They tested them to make sure that they were accurate. This is a really good science. And the data is not absolutely clear with it. They don't, the data does not say go vegan. But it definitely points towards the fact that animal protein uh, is associated with weight gain, diabetes, heart disease, and, length, and longevity problems. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like it because it's many different societies and it's a long-term study and it, it, there's just so many people, 500,000 people. It's huge. Um, when was that study conducted? It's still going on. It started in the early 2000s and still going mm. on. So they're building this gigantic database. Is there a, like a good uh, link online where people can see that or at least find information about that? Um, if you just look up EPIC, E-P-I-C, uh, EPIC Panacea. Um, there's a, they've got their central website, which kind of explains it. Mm-hmm. Um, there are so many articles on PubMed. Um, uh, they had an international consortium kind of going over all the data they've had so far last year, where they made strong reference to the fact that protein was associated with diabetes and strong fact to the, re- uh, strong reference to the fact that protein causes weight gain. Mm-hmm. Uh, both were in there. Um, but there's many different articles that go through there. Um, the One of the head authors of your PubMed searching is Vergno, V-E-R-G-N-A-U-D. Uh, and he's done some really good science. Well, I don't know if it's him. It's his team. But, yeah. Um, 
and you know, there's they have a certain group of Epic, so you can go into the Epic data, and they've looked specifically at Epic Oxford because Oxford's kind of interesting because there they have healthy meat eaters, so they don't eat meat nearly as much as the rest of the country, and they um, live a healthy lifestyle, and they wanted to compare them to vegans to mm-hmm. see if there was benefit. Now, again, I told you those vegans were not healthy vegans. Yeah, it's it's there's this idea that a vegan is a vegan, right. you know what I mean? That's a whole, yeah. you know, spectrum of oh, yeah. ways of eating. Yeah. Like I told you, <laughs> I was telling you, I went to a vegan junk food restaurant because when you're in LA, you do those things. Yeah. And I had a, uh, bacon cheeseburger. Oh my God. I mean, it tastes just like what I remember bacon cheeseburgers taste like, but felt so sick afterwards. And that's definitely not healthy. So <laughs> if you're eating that, you're not a healthy vegan. Yeah. There's so many, I mean, now you can get so much vegan junk food, so much vegan which junk is food. like great yeah. and terrible at the same time. Exactly. Um, but it, still, when they look at the Epic Oxford, the vegans tend to do better than the uh, meat eaters. The one spot they didn't was colon cancer, uh, which is bizarre because vegans always do better in colon cancer. But it may just be that these vegans were not eating much uh, fiber mm-hmm. and probably a lot of processed food. Mm-hmm. Um, other studies I love... The Harvard studies are really good. They, they're following the, the with the Harvard studies. They followed um, um, nurses for many years now. I think twenty, thirty years. The nurses' health study, and they've done the same with health professionals, um, um, men that were doctors, health professionals. And they followed them for many years, and they've looked at diet patterns. The only problem with that study is there's not there's hard to find a difference if everyone's eating the same thing. In other words, if you've got a group that's eating meat three times a day and another group that's eating meat two times a day, can you really make a correlation mm-hmm. uh, or really make a judgment pattern? That's, that's a little bit of a problem with theirs, but it's pretty good. My favorite studies are the Adventist Health Study because I said you can't do a long-term study where you make someone vegan and you make someone a meat eater, but that's happening in Loma Linda, California mm-hmm. because the Seventh-day Adventists believe that the body is the temple of the soul and it should be treated as such. So the whole group is healthy. They have very similar exercise patterns. They live in the same environment, exposed to the same toxins, but some of them are vegan. Some will do milk and dairy. Some will eat fish and some will uh, eat meat. And they've got low meat eaters and high meat eaters. So they've got this already partitioned off group of people that have a different level of consumption of these meats. And their data is very, very convincing. And that's probably my favorite studies of the mm-hmm. Adventist Health 2 study. And that and that data suggests what? It definitely suggests that a plant-based diet is better for you. I mean, it, they have got very strong data showing a plant-based diet prevents uh, diabetes, very strong data that it prevents uh, heart disease, very strong data that it um, prevents cancer. Um, fish does well in that group, um, but in the other ones, not as much. And then um, just length of life. The vegans live mm-hmm. li- live longer than the other groups. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's that uh, <clears throat> that cardiologist, Doctor Ellsworth. Yeah, I saw him the name? other day. Yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. He's I, 95 I saw him on TV. or yeah. something. <laughs> I think he's 100, isn't he? Is oh, he is he 100 now? The surgeon? Yeah, 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 yeah. But he practiced until just recently. That's right. He right? practiced until he was 95. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that Crazy, guy's amazing. Right? I got to get that guy on the podcast. Oh, you got to get him on. Yeah. He yeah, just yeah. seems like such a nice guy, sweet guy. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, all right. So you know that's all interesting. You know, and I'm I'm just thinking. Um, you know, how does that, like, how does it, how does it happen that you see these studies, you understand them, you're convinced, and yet at the same time, you know, right now we're all being told that, you know, we need to eat more protein. We're in this massive, you know, protein push, uh, plant protein is, 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 uh, not as superior to the human condition and health as animal right. protein. Yeah, look at you and me wasting away um, without our protein. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and that saturated fat is not a problem. Meanwhile, uh, is it the USDA that is suggesting that we shouldn't worry about cholesterol, cholesterol. anymore? I think that the USDA is kind of like, look, we're going to tell you to eat less meat. <laughs> we're going to tell you to eat less fat. And that'll take care of the cholesterol. But in order, you know, the, the, the lobbyists are on them all oh, the time. Yeah. So I think this is a little flag. Hey, we'll give you back your cholesterol because they're not going to be able to eat it anyway because they're not supposed to be eating meat. So. Well, the politics behind that are pretty extraordinary. extraordinary. I mean, for the listener right now, the USDA, is it every four years, has to come every up with years. their dietary guidelines and they impanel like a, a group of advisors to help suggest how they might make changes to, you know, that nutrition sort of 
pyramid or plate or whatever it is these days. And for the first time ever, they're suggesting uh, eating less meat uh, for health reasons, but also for sustainability reasons. And this has caused quite the stir amongst the meat and dairy lobby people who are up in arms that uh, sustainability or environmental concern should even play a part at all in dietary recommendations. And so there's all these congressmen and senators who are, have constituencies in you know, the heartland of America who are petitioning the USDA that they've overstepped their boundaries and that this is, you know, this is not their job. Right. I mean, we asked the question, how are we also confused it's because of the industry? I mean, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's a fact. I mean, you, they're everywhere. They're um, you could go back to the 70s when they had the Senate Select Commission, the McGovern Commission, that got together to find out why we were getting more and more heart disease. And they did huge rounds of uh, research and came up with the idea that we need to eat less meat. And uh, that was completely the, the meat industry jumped on it, got McGovern voted out, uh, got the committee disbanded. And it was all you could watch it in place. Uh, you could watch it happening. And it still happens now. But the other problem is the medical profession in general, because the medical profession is not designed to treat a whole person. Um, for, you know, the GI doctor treats the stomach, the heart doctor treats the heart. And when we were in residency and there was a patient, we didn't even call them by their name. It was like, you know, the colon cancer in room two. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, I'd go in and examine the patient, you know, and would dive right for their stomach, you know. Uh, I'm not asking them how they're feeling, what are they eating. We do these, like, complex history and physicals, and yet I never ask them what they eat, mm-hmm. you know. I got, you know, all this obscure stuff, but I don't ask them probably the most important question, what are you eating? And, and so it, it's very hard for a doctor. We don't learn any nutrition. I mean, any nutrition in medical school. So it's very hard for a doctor to even think about nutrition. And I've talked to doctors about this many times. Uh, Number one, they're reading journals that have to do with their specialty. They're not reading the nutrition journals. Number two, even if they thought, like I gave a a talk to this endocrine society, and I've got so much data showing the correlation between meat and and diabetes, it's crazy. It's very hard to argue with. And so the endocrinologists were like, okay, that's probably true, but listen, My patients aren't going to change. They're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. So why do I even worry about that? Instead, I'm just going to give them a medicine. Mm -hmm. In addition... That's a terrible mindset. It's a terrible mindset, but that's what they're built with. And and you know what? It's easy to sit and say that's a terrible mindset. It's much harder when you're sitting across from a patient and you've got 20 minutes with a patient and you got to tell them to change it their whole lifestyle and how they eat, it's not so easy. And patients mm-hmm. don't do it. I mean, I, I experience this all the time. Now, I, I'm in a little bit of an advantage because I've got this big office with dietitians and psychologists, and I spend more time with them. And, and But for for an endocrinologist to sit there and like, well, let me tell you about plant-based diet, very difficult. Not impossible, but very difficult. The other thing is that as a doctor, you know, I hear people say, oh, doctors just want to keep you sick. That's not the reason. It's not like doctors are in this conspiracy to keep people sick. That's, <laughs> that's really nonsense. Uh-huh. Um, but the system is set up to right. diagnose and prescribe. And that's you know, exactly there, is it. A, there is an economy around that, right. that in order for it to sustain itself and for everybody to, you know, profit off of right. it, um, it has to work a certain way. Right. But the doctor's not thinking, I need to write the script because I need to profit off it. The doctor's thinking, my job is to write a script. Like a patient comes in, there's a problem. I got to do something about it. You know how mm-hmm. they say men always have to fix something? Mm-hmm. Well, doctors always have to fix something too. It's that, that it's this notion that uh, that it's broken. I got to do something to fix it. So I'm going to throw this. And they'll, and they'll put medicines on there that will give a temporary fix, but you know aren't going to have a long-term fix. Mm-hmm. Now, on the flip side, the scientists, they really do miss the forest for the trees, so to speak. So they they just don't have any clinical realm to understand how their data fits in. So I was at a a scientific meeting and this lady was giving this um, excellent review of her research that showed that heme iron, which is the iron that's in animal protein, Mm -hmm. is very damaging to the islet cells of the pancreas that secrete insulin. Mm. And the data was very convincing. And at the end, you know, there's question sessions and someone got up and they asked her and they said, okay, well, with all you've learned, what kind of diet do you follow? And she was kind of taken aback. She goes, oh, well, I do a high-protein, low-carb diet. 
<laughs> and I mean, I, I, I almost wanted to fall out of the chair. I'm like, you just told us that heme iron is bad for your pancreas. She, she's overweight. It, she also talked about heme iron and its oxidative problems and how it could make you overweight and things like that. And then you say that you eat a high protein diet, which is high heme diet. You mm-hmm. might as well have said, I just, I, I eat exactly the opposite of my clinical findings. Right. And, and for the listener, the pro, the iron that's found in plants is non-heme. It's a different type of iron. And that's also often pointed towards as a reason to not adopt a plant-based diet, particularly if you're an athlete, that the non-heme variety of iron is, um, <clears throat> is sort of, uh, insufficient, I suppose, in terms of carrying oxygen to your blood or or whatever it is that it's supposed to do. It doesn't do it as well as the heme variety. Which is unfounded and not true. There's there's so many things that are said that are just like so completely untrue. I just wonder where it starts. I think what happens is some blogger just says it and then, you know, they tell two people and they tell two people and then all of a sudden there, it is true that um, vegans tend to be, have a little bit lower iron, but not anemic. They don't have any higher incidence of anemia. Yeah, I heard that the, the the incidence of anemia is pretty much uniform across you know vegan and meat eaters. It's very uniform, which is surprising because I think that is one of the ideas that if you're going to be vegan, you got to watch out for your iron and you might become anemic. I mean, I have so many meat eating anemic patients; it's unbelievable. And How the funny you thing, become is- anemic if you're eating a high protein animal based diet. Well, I mean, there's many different reasons. You could develop gastritis. You could have diverticulitis. You can um, have um, pernicious anemia where your um, stomach has a problem producing factors that help you absorb uh, different vitamins that help you uh, make blood cells. There's many Mm -hmm. different ways. The funny thing to me, though, is that if someone's on a vegan diet, that is the answer to any problem that they have when they see another doctor. You know, patients will come to me and they'll be like, my doctor says, you know, I'm anemic, so I need to go off my vegan diet. I'm like, what does he tell his meat eaters that are anemic? Or they'll say, I'm hypothyroid. My doctor says it's because of my vegan diet. I'm like, what about the millions of hypothyroid meat eaters? It's because it's a mystery, I think, to most doctors. And it's an exactly. easy thing to point out that is distinguishes you from the typical patient that they're exactly. going to see, right? Exactly. And, and because they don't fully understand it, it's, you can just identify it as it must be the culprit. Yeah. And I find a lot of doctors find it offensive somehow. Like they feel like, um, I'm going to tell you what's right for you. You know, when I, I didn't tell you to go on the vegan diet, so it's got to be wrong for you. <laughs> they, almost, they almost don't want to be proved wrong, you know? That's interesting. Yeah. Well, it's so bizarre because when you look at a whole food plant-based diet, I mean, you know, <clears throat> unless I'm missing something, it pretty much seems to be the ultimate way to prevent and reverse chronic lifestyle disease, no Definitely. matter what form or shape that may take. Yeah. And so to the extent that it could be identified as the problem that's leading towards your malady just right. seems ironic. Yeah. I, and sometimes this is crazy to me. I mean, I gave a talk recently to a bunch of bariatric doctors. I mean, these are doctors that are dealing with people with weight issues. And what we're feeling what we're finding out now with in weight loss surgery is people start to regain the weight after a while. And so they're in this conference talking about people that are regaining weight and they're talking about what other surgery can we do for their regain of weight. Mm-hmm. And no one is mentioning food at all. So I was one of the, uh, the speakers and I got up there and I said, "How many of you have heard of the Epic study?" I mean, this is the biggest study ever on food and, and nutrition. Not a single person raised their hand. How many of so you bariatric surgeons? Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> How many of you have studied the nurses health study? Zero hands. Anybody know about the advanced health study? Zero hands. So there's just so uneducated about this stuff. And the thing that kills me is there's But it's not because they're they're lazy. It's no. not even their fault. Like they're just busy living their lives and exactly. trying to do what they do. Yeah. I mean, bariatric surgery, you know, the act of cutting the stomach, making it smaller, bypassing it, it works. They get their results, so they think that's all I need. You mm-hmm. know, uh, in the surgeon world, a chance to cut is a chance to cure, and um, that's all that's going through their mind. The, that's, but that's a display of the problem. You know, for the heart doctor, it's a chance to give someone Lipitor is a chance to save a life, a chance to. Yeah, but these are these are these are addressing symptoms, right? Not the underlying cause that's leading that right. patient to right. get to that place. Because I mean, that's what medical school does. It teaches you to treat symptoms. Mm-hmm. It doesn't treat you to teach a larger cause. It doesn't teach. Food is medicine, uh, and that's one of the central things that we have to deal with. That's what, really one of the biggest problems. And it kills me because, look, you get someone like Dean Orders. You, you put it all together, right? You, you have to have, you can't, there's no one study that puts it all together. But, like, Dean did some really interesting stuff recently. So there was a lot 
of epidemiologic data that shows that meat consumption correlates with prostate cancer. If you look at parts of the world where they don't have a lot of prostate cancer, they don't eat a lot of meat. Now, some people said, well, that might be because they're just not pe- testing. They're not testing for prostate cancer. Okay, that's possible, but we, they looked specifically at Japan where they did a very strong testing protocol where they had very low rates of prostate cancer. And then they looked at migration studies where Japanese men moved to America, boom, they're getting prostate cancer. So there's mm-hmm. not kind of any genetic protection. So Dean took a group of people that had a high PSA diagnosed prostate cancer, but had refused therapy. They didn't want any therapy. And so he put one group into his lifestyle medicine, which is meditation, exercise, and a vegan diet. I wish he would just, I wish he would separate that up a bit. Um, because yeah, because I think that's a, it, it, it opens him, him up to criticism. Yeah. People say, well, he gets people to quit smoking and yeah. he gets them to start exercising. And so how can you really say what it is that's right. impacting that? Yeah, I'm, I believe a lot in meditation, but I don't think meditation stopped the prostate cancer cells here. Mm-hmm. That's as much as I'll say. The um, other group just did a conventional stuff. They did, as I remember, I go, I go through so many studies, but as I remember, there was not a lot of smokers. And I think the smoking groups were pretty equal. And then he followed them for six months. So at six months, the group on the plant-based diet had a dramatic drop in their PSA, whereas the group not on the plant-based diet had an actual increase in their PSA, and more mm-hmm. of them had to go towards conventional therapy. But then he took that one, one step further. He took the serum, their blood serum. He took prostate cancer cells and put them in a dish, dripped the blood serum of the plant-based eater versus just the regular person. And the plant-based eaters, their Serum was eight times more effective at killing pancreas cell, uh, at killing prostate cancer cells. Mm. So there's something in the serum. Then he took it a step further. He took their hormone, their um, not their hormones, their chromosomes, and he worked with a Nobel Prize uh, winner who had studied what's called telomeres. Telomeres are like the caps mm. on chromosomes. Think of them as like the, like the cap of a on the end of your shoelace to prevent the shoelace from unraveling. And it has been shown that the longer the telomere the less likely you are to get genetic damage. And in fact, they found that the plant-based eating group had a longer telomere. They lengthened their telomere over time. That's that's amazing. I think think, think telomere research is the next thing. You know how like it's all about like the gut biome right now? I think think, think it's telomere because when you start looking into that, it's pretty fascinating, Mm -hmm. uh, the link between... Um, you know, sort of extending telomere length and and cell life, longevity, and right. aging. It's quite fascinating. It's amazing. So, so why wasn't the nightly news like groundbreaking study coming out? You know, of University of California, San Francisco. It just it kind of comes out and goes away. Why do you think that is? Well, I think it goes back to this. You know, we're telling people they need to change their lifestyle. People don't want to change their lifestyle and the industry is providing them all kinds of reasons to believe that whatever the study is, uh, it is a, a, just a side, you know, a study that really isn't anything to be worried about. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a lot easier to get people to pay attention to something that um, affirms that there is good news about your bad habits. Yeah, of course. You know, yeah. there's big, a big study of butter and saying butter is good for you and everybody's so, so excited, which is so bizarre because we are the most unhealthy country in the world, right? We have the highest uh, obesity, highest diabetes, highest cancer, one of the lowest longevity rates. And yet we try, <laughs> we eat more protein than any other country in the world. And yet we want to eat more protein. And I keep asking my patients, how's it working for you? Mm-hmm. You know, oh, I've been on this protein diet. I've been on that protein diet. And I'm like, well, you got to stop eating that much protein. Like, what do you mean? Yeah, I got to eat protein. Well, how's it working for you? It's mm-hmm. not working. It's not working for the country. Why aren't we looking at the countries that are the healthiest and what they're doing? And there was a great project done um, in North Karelia where they really did an excellent job in uh, cardiac morbidity and mortality by getting people to stop eating butter. Mm. That was their big project, is getting people to stop eating butter. And here we are saying butter is good for you. It's just, it, it blows my mind. Well, you look at the statistics and how unhealthy we are, uh, <laughs> and then you compare that to our obsession with health, because there's no other country that's also as obs- as obsessed with weight loss and health as we are. And then when you study these cultures that have the, you know, the longest incidence of longevity and are the most disease free. And they don't, I don't think they really think about 
health and dieting and you know they're not going to the gym right they're not taking supplements yeah so it's it's this weird mashup of of being unhealthy and yet being obsessed with health at the same time but pursuing a track that is not solving the problem right right And, and, and sometimes i just feel like i'm in the twilight zone with it it's like people just think about it. It's just so obvious. But um. So on that note, like a couple things. I mean, the first thing is I'm sure that people come up to you all the time and say, you know, when you start, when you start spouting your Garth Davis plant-based diatribe, you know, they go, well, listen, Garth, don't you know that the China study was debunked? Everybody knows that it was debunked. I mean, what is your response to that? You know, I never mention the China study anywhere in any of my talks. It's kind of older data, and Colin did a lot of study on rats, and I'm not a big fan of rat studies. So mm-hmm. it's just, you know, I don't, I don't, Colin has certainly not been debunked by anybody. I mean, the big thing was that Denise Minger uh, debunked him, and she put up a, uh, a rant where she took some of his raw data and did what we talked about earlier, did a univariate analysis, said, look at this group, they're eating more wheat. Uh, and they have more heart disease. And but they, the, what she didn't do is look at the fact that they were also eating more meat. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's she didn't she didn't do a good scientific study. Now, interestingly, so she's sort of guilty of what she was accusing him of doing. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that that happens all the time. A lot of the, these paleo people and and high protein people and everything like that they they will criticize any study unless it's their study. Uh, like, a, you know, uh, epidemiology is terrible, but if you come out with an epidemiology study that says meat is good, all of a sudden that's the greatest study that ever lived. So, yeah, we see that a lot from them. Now, interesting, Denise has come out recently saying, you know what, a vegan diet might actually be the right diet. What she's come down to is now that there's two extremes that seem to work, either an extreme high fat, high protein, low carb diet, or an extreme vegan diet, and mm-hmm. everything in the middle is is wrong. Hmm. Well, what about that? What about, well, let's talk about the, the extreme, you know, high fat, high protein, low carb diet. Because yeah. that is, you know, that is, of, you know, that is in vogue right now. It's in vogue. A lot of the studies um, were come out, come out from a guy named Noakes who was studying this in athletes. The idea was if I could get an athlete on a bike for a long distance and not needing any food during that time, just using fat. Fat adapted. Fat adapted. That that would uh, that that would be a superior uh, situation. Fact of the matter is, Noakes was successful. You can do that. You can fat adapt, and then you can go on a long bike ride using your fat. Does that correlate to more weight loss than any of the other diets? No. Does it correlate to better times for the athlete? No. Nope. Um, and so it, it it really didn't amount to anything than to say, yes, you can fat adapt, but is fat adapt better? Not necessarily. Now, the problem has come where you've taken data on on well-trained athletes and try to apply it to the population as a whole. Mm-hmm. And the problem comes several ways. So people hear, um, oh, I lost weight on a high-protein diet. Now, the reason people lose weight on a high-protein diet is they go into ketosis, what happens is they basically deplete their body of glycogen. Glycogen is the storage of carbs in the muscles. You, the muscles are stored with water, so you definitely lose water. And the ketones that are formed um, make you diurese more, so you know you pee off some water, and so you lose weight. But every study done on these high-protein diets is that you will lose weight for a while, then you'll slowly start to gain it back. What happens is people then think, okay, on this extreme diet, people lost weight with protein. So it must be that protein, if I eat it, even not in an extreme situation, it's going to make me lose weight. And that's nonsense. I I can't tell you, there are so many studies, I got tired reading it, that if you take a person and you put them on an 1800 calorie diet, it doesn't matter how much protein. They've done studies where they've done really high protein and low protein and middle protein. It doesn't matter. The macronutrient combination does not affect the weight loss, so long as you're eating 1800. There was a professor out of Kentucky who ate nothing but Twinkies and Oreos and junk food, but he kept his weight, his calories under 1800. He lost weight. He lost uh, his LDL cholesterol went down, even though he's eating Twinkies. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the funny thing is, as soon as he started eating meat, it all came back on. Interesting. Because he didn't eat any meat during that time. He was just eating, he ate one salad a day and then junk food the rest of the time. So macronutrient combinations. Everyone's counting macros. That's the big thing now. Counting macros, it makes no difference in weight loss. The calorie count does. Now, here's the thing. 
the calorie count is so important, but people do a terrible job counting calories because they just totally mess up how many calories are in fat. I mean, they oil up their pan. You know, Pam cooking spray, it says low fat cooking. Right. Yeah. One well, says like zero grams of fat on right. the front because you'd have to have a microgram. Yeah. You know, it's a one fourth of a surging, second. The yeah. serving size is one so fourth small. a second of a spray. Yeah. But people are just spraying it all in there. And you go out to eat and you get a calorie count on the food that you're eating, but that doesn't count the grease that's on the. So I find people do a really b- bad job um, calorie counting. But but here's the thing: when you eat meat, let's go away from the weight loss because that's all anybody seems to care about: weight loss and muscles. This is, no one seems to really care about the heart disease until they have it. Um, but every time you eat meat, a few things happen. You put acid into your body because meat is heavy in amino acids. Uh, and those acids that have sulfa definitely increase the acid content in the body. Now your body has to buffer that acid and in buffering the acid, that's where you get a lot of problems. So it steals a lot of calcium from muscles. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the problems that with the, with the bodybuilding population is I think they're asking the wrong question question. They're looking at how much protein do I need to eat to gain muscle? Instead, they should be asking, what do I need to eat to maintain muscle? Mm-hmm. Um, the second thing you're doing is you're eating heterocyclic amines, which are known carcinogens. But every time you cook a steak, that burned muscle turns into a chemical that can uh, cause cancer. Uh, you're uh, developing n nitroso compounds, another carcinogen. You are uh, getting advanced glycolated end products. I mean, I could go on and on. The list goes on and on of all these terrible toxins and stuff that you're putting into your body every time you eat a steak. Um, And we have all this data that, you know, long term, it's not good for you. So I just don't understand, you know, why, if it's not going to help you lose weight and if it's not going to help you live longer, why people are doing it. And the answer is the industries out there. I mean, they'll sell you those protein shakes. They sell those protein shakes I have protein shakes in my office. Simply, I tell my patients not to drink them, except we need them around the time of surgery. They sell that protein shake to lose weight. It's the exact same product that's being sold for other people to gain weight. Bodybuilders to gain weight. Yeah. Yeah. It's the exact same product. Interesting. Uh, Well, isn't that there on the slow carb diet? I think it's the idea is that you're supposed to start your day with a, a you know 25 grams of protein and a shake, and that somehow this has sets you up for you know I don't know better metabolism throughout the day that will lead to weight loss. Right, and there are some data that that do show uh, some good satiety, but the the problem with the data is they're never they're always comparing shake to shake. So they're taking a shake and they're varying the carbohydrate and the protein, and then testing it and see who's hunger later, hungrier later. The plant-based diet wins because of fiber. That's what is the satiating factor. And so I I don't really care if a low-fat, high-carb shake makes you hungrier if it doesn't have fiber in it because that's not what I'm eating and not what I'm telling my patients to eat. They did a really good study where they had people sit down and eat different meals and then check how hungry they were at the next meal and the meal after. And the most satiating food you could possibly eat was a potato. Mm Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think in one of your, I think it was in your talk that I saw recently, you said something like, uh, you know, only 3% of the population is protein deficient. And, but. No, like, I would say less than but that. Like, but like 97% of the population is fiber deficient. And what we should be exactly. talking about is fiber and not protein. Right. Right. When you look at, they came out with the new NHANES data and what do we actually eat in this country? No one's protein deficient. You got to understand the RDA. Well, pro- a protein deficiency would be starvation. It would be starvation, right? like core sugars. Yeah, season. exactly. You'd have to you would have to not be eating. You'd have to be eating less than a thousand calories to probably get it. Um, and so you, we just don't see that. Um, so the RDA, when they set up their recommendation for protein requirements, they based it on some uh, nitrogen balance studies and all this kind of stuff, and they came up with a figure. Like for men, 56 grams, and for women, 44 grams or 42 grams. And that figure is actually an optimal amount. It's not a minimal amount. I think people think that's the lowest amount that I should get. It's actually the optimal amount. Based on those studies, probably you would do fine with 30 grams of protein, but they just want to make sure that everybody was covered. Now, we eat 70 to 100, sometimes 130 grams of protein a day. So we're way over the optimal amount. We're, mm-hmm. we're way in excess. I and mean, all these studies where they've gone and interviewed people, the one thing everyone's looking for is even more protein. It makes, it's crazy. Yet we eat unbelievably low amounts of fiber. And there, there are not a lot of good studies that show that there's long-term health in eating a lot of protein. There's tons of good studies, tons and tons, showing eating a lot of fiber is good for you long-term. 
And we are unbelievable. We are in a mass deficit of fiber, and yet no one's talking about that. Well, don't you know that we we shouldn't be eating fruit? That this is terrible. Yeah, I and mean, that really makes me want to jump off. Uh, a sugar is a sugar. Yeah, a sugar is a sugar is ridiculous. A sugar, a sugar is not true if a sugar is combined with fiber. Um, that fiber makes sugar into a slow release pill. Mm-hmm. It, what people don't understand, it is almost impossible. And this is true of sugar too. It's almost impossible for a sugar, for a carb, to be turned to fat. It's called de novo lipogenesis. And your body will not turn sugar or carbs to fat until you've completely saturated all of the glycogen in your body, which is about 1,500 grams of, mm-hmm. of glycogen. And then if you, once you've saturated glycogen, it'll still give you some leeway where you eat more carbs, it's going to try to burn them more. It actually ups the metabolism to try to burn them. People say that protein ups the metabolism. Carbs don't at the regular intake, but if you overeat carbs, it actually ups your te- metabolism to try to burn them. Um, and so it's very difficult to turn carbs to fat. Now, simple sugars will make you hungry because it'll make your blood sugar rise and then drop, and then you're going to want more sugar, and you get these sweets, cravings, et cetera, et cetera. So I definitely don't tell people to eat sugar, but for the love of God, eat fruit. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's made that we are fruit eaters. Everything about our body, about our anatomy. You look at comparative science. Yeah, I, I was watching Naked and Afraid. You ever watch Naked and Afraid? Uh-uh. Oh, it's this great show where they drop people off naked in the middle of the wilderness and they almost die and then they pick them up 21 <laughs> days later. But I'm, I'm watching them and there's this one scene where this lady's like, just she's just dying. And she's, the whole, every show, they're talking about how they need to get protein. They're like, we need to get some protein. I need to get protein now. I'm going to die. And yeah, they do need to probably get some protein because they're eating zero calories. But I'm, in this one scene, this monkey's kind of just sitting down, eating a branch, eating some leaves, looking at them, just like, oh, you idiots. And I'm thinking to myself, eat what the monkey's eating, because we are made <laughs> to eat what the monkey's eating. Uh-huh. I would follow that monkey around and eat that monkey's food. Uh, yeah, but, but don't volunteer me. I don't want to do that show. But, <laughs> but, but the point being, we are perfectly created to eat fruit. We could live long, healthy lives just eating fruit. You and I both know fruititarians mm-hmm. who eat the majority of their calories from fruit, and they're unbelievably healthy people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. I mean, as a marathoner and an Ironman athlete yourself, uh, is there any argument to be made that um, <clears throat> when you're training really hard, if you want to get as strong as possible, if you want to build lean, you know, muscle mass, et cetera, that you should eat protein in excess of your RDA? Uh, yeah, that's a tough question. And in my book, I kind of go into this a bit. It, it's so much harder to study this than it is the other stuff. Um, and there, there's good data, but then every time I see a good paper, it's always industry sponsored. And I've talked with the scientists. They're like, look, we couldn't get anything done if the industry doesn't sponsor us. It doesn't mm-hmm. mean that it's good science. If you're just an average person, no. So, you know, and everyone thinks they're more than an average person, but no one's doing the workouts that mm-hmm. we know it takes to be uh, in that above average field. So for them, absolutely not. Now, um, for real athletes, it, there has been some increase. Uh, they look at muscle protein synthesis. And there is some increased muscle protein synthesis with about 20 grams of protein after um, a workout. The studies are hard to look at because there's many confounding factors. They they have people start they're fasted when they do their workout, so mm-hmm. they're already you know going on the deficient. Then they get the protein. So there's other argue, studies that argue you know um, it doesn't matter when you eat the protein as long as you have protein all day long. I, I would say probably a modest increase in protein would be fine, but plant-based protein is fine. I mm-hmm. personally never count, ever, never count. I never mm-hmm. think to myself I need to get protein. I'll make a post-workout shake where I will throw in some hemp seeds, and I'll get some protein there. I eat nuts during the day. I'll get protein there. I eat a lot of beans, and I'm only getting stronger and faster. I mean, every year I just seem to be growing. So for me, I, I, it doesn't seem to uh, be effect. In the you know vegan bodybuilding world, I've interviewed a bunch of people. A lot of them say they don't do extra protein. They do the same thing I do. Uh, you know, at the end of a workout, they'll go and eat a meal mm-hmm. with beans in it, which to me is the healthy thing to do. But I, I, I don't know. I can't vouch for the truth. Uh, you know, and I don't know if they're doing steroids or anything like that. They look great. Yeah, interesting. I mean, is there an argument to be made that uh, that 
the protein from animal flesh is qualitatively different from the protein from plants? In other words, is an amino acid an amino acid irrespective of where it comes from? Or is the matrix in which, it, which it's delivered to your body, does that make a difference in term, terms mm. of how you metabolize it, the bioavailability and all of that? Yeah, you know, um, uh, you bring up a good point, but um, the studies that have shown that bioavailability of plant-based proteins is excellent. The problem is more like the um, uh, the actual uh, amino acid array in each protein. So meat-based proteins are a little bit... Uh, I hate the term complete because that makes people think that they're better, but they've got higher of certain proteins. Um, like, for instance, plant-based proteins are much higher in glutamic acid. Now, glutamic acid is fantastic for lowering blood pressure, mm-hmm. which might be part of the reason plants are so good with lowering blood pressure. Meat-based proteins are higher in branched-chain amino acids. Now, if you're a bodybuilder, this is good for several reasons. It increases IGF-1. IGF-1 is a growth hormone, so it's a growth hormone. You're going to grow your muscles. Number two, um, there are definitely uh, things like leucine definitely stimulate muscle protein synthesis. And so if you're a bodybuilder, you want to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. But here's the catch. We know from aging studies and from cancer studies that having a high IGF-1 and high leucine actually leads to premature aging and cellular death and cancer. Mm -hmm. So what I'm seeing from these bodybuilding protocols that may in fact make a bodybuilder have more muscle may make them unhealthier in the long term. I mean, it's impossible to do a good study on it, but if you look at old bodybuilders, they all have a scar down the middle of their chest. They've all had heart surgery. Now, is it the high protein diets? Or is it the steroids? I, you know, I can't differentiate that and tell you that. Right, but it's that argument of uh, the difference between a performance-oriented diet, like a short-term performance-oriented diet, versus long-term longevity maximum wellness diet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, look at look at Scott Jurek. Look at um, um, Dave Scott when he was competing at his peak. I mean, these athletes were the top of their game, and they were eating plant-based diets and not concentrating on protein. Mm -hmm. And I I find a lot of these, there's more and more athletes coming out of the woodworks now that are following a plant-based diet and say that they feel better than ever now. Like I told you before, they obviously have less acid in their body, so they're not trying to buffer the acid with calcium from the muscle. And so maybe you do a study that look at muscle protein synthesis, and there's a slight advantage if you're getting more protein. But what we're not studying is what's muscle breakdown over the long term. And I think that's you know a lot of these um, bodybuilders that you talk to that are vegan bodybuilders, every year they seem to be consistently big. They don't seem to go through these fluxes that other people go to. But this is a field that is wrought with... I, I could tell you very confidently about the cancer and the longevity. I, I can't tell you that confidently about built, building muscle and performance. Mm-hmm. Well, I noticed on your Facebook page, you shared that picture of that dude who was like the butcher. Who yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the dude yeah. is Fraser. absolutely ripped. Yeah, Fraser Bailey. Yeah, he's, a, he's a great guy because he has totally changed his whole life. Like this guy, just like a light bulb went on. He used to be a butcher. Mm -hmm. Now he gained his muscle back when he was a meat eater, but he's honed it now that he's a plant-based eater. Swears he doesn't do steroids. Everybody on my thing is steroids, steroids, Mm -hmm. steroids. I've never tested him, so I can't test. I would say absolutely he doesn't because he swears he doesn't. But after Lance Armstrong, I've given up swearing for other people. But my point on that picture was not um, steroids or how he looks or anything. It was just his story of transformation, how great mm-hmm. he feels now. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I want to get back to this idea of fat ad- adaptation and, and ketosis and the mm-hmm. like. And, you know, as an endurance athlete, becoming fat adapted, that's something that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. The more fat adapted I can become, the longer I can go without relying on nutrition, mm-hmm. the more efficient I am in whether it's cycling or swimming or, or running or what have you. Um, and I've worked on my fat adaptation predominantly through training protocols that focus on you know, enhancing my aerobic uh, zone capacity by, training in, yeah, by yeah. training in that zone. And it's, it, my experience, and it's completely anecdotal, has been that I'm able to do that through how I train. It's less about, you know, it's less about the diet aspect of it than it is what what does my training look like. So, you know, I'm sure that that you know when you go out and you do those fasted workouts, that it has some impact on that. Um, 
but it, but if I do that, then I pay for it the next day or the day after. Like I can't train every single day consistently if I'm depriving my body of nutrients when I go out to train. So when I'm looking at like the course of a season, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm focusing on that Z2 work, mm -hmm. which really allows me to really enhance my ability that go all day mm -hmm. speed, which is really fat adapt adaptation, but mm -hmm. I'm just doing it through the training as opposed to trying to achieve that through what I'm putting in my mouth. Yeah. I mean, I, there's certainly data to say that if you're going at zone two, you are burning fat. If you do it in a fasted state, you're, you're going to, you know, start fat adapting. The, but the literature has been really weak on, on any kind of performance advantage to that. Um, and so it, it may be, and it, it's certainly weak on, Everyone's like, oh, I want to burn fat, thinking that they're going to have a six-pack abs by doing that. That doesn't mm -hmm. tend to turn out to be the case. There's a there's multiple variables we got to think about, and that is, what about the acid load you're taking in, and how does that affect your performance? So while you're burning your fat, you're also got a lot of acid in your body, and that might be detrimental. You're missing out on the phytonutrients and nutrients and things that you, you would typically be eating in a high-carb diet. Uh, which may be affecting your performance. And the one thing that you will always hear from plant-based athletes that I think you really mess up when you start trying to do fat adaption is, is recovery. Um, it, it just seems that that high fruit, you know, uh, smoothie you make after that workout really helps you recover for the next day's workout. And so I just, I, I, I I see the science in the fat adaptation, but I don't see the benefit. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I, I was uh, on the Joe Rogan podcast recently, and the question, the topic came up about ketosis. And I made, I don't know exactly what I said, but I said something like, you know, I'm just not, I'm not sure that it's really the healthiest thing to do for you long term. Like it's sort of a critical state. I mean, it's sort of a, um, an emergency state it's an emergency of your state. body, right? right. Mm -hmm. And I didn't go really much further beyond that. And then I got beat up for not knowing what I was talking about and misunderstanding what ketosis Joe is. Joe Rogan teach you? And, uh, no, he didn't. Oh, but okay. sort of the comments and the uh, feedback that kind of that swirled around that as a result of that, like, he, you know, he was cool. We didn't, we didn't really get into some huge debate about it. Mm. Um, so, you know, educate me about what ketosis is. Like, am I, was I mischaracterizing it? Or what no. is your understanding of, of what it means to be in ketosis? Because I feel like there's this movement whereby, uh, you know, ketosis has become this aspirational lifestyle for people, that they're, they're always trying to be in ketosis, that on some level, this, the argument is made that this is a natural state of man and, and we should be, you know, trying to be in this state and that we can and, and, and can be health, healthy doing this. Yeah, no, the, 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 and that is with zero evidence whatsoever. I mean, all the ketosis studies are so short term, they are ridiculous. I mean, really short term. Uh, secondly, it is, it is an emergency state for our bodies to live in. Uh, we don't want to be in ketosis. Um, our bodies thrive. I mean, if you look at the Krebs cycle, which is the cycle that generates energy, the input is glucose. That's the input. Now, there are other places where we can input in emergency situations, and that's where the ketones come in from. But our primary, um, our primary fuel for our body comes from glucose and certainly from our brain. So our body mm -hmm. can... That's, I use, made that point too yeah. and was told that I didn't know what I was talking about. No, it's absolutely true. <laughs> the brain actually can't live off our fat, but it can live off... Um, only glucose. Now, um, um, it, the ketones do cross the blood-brain barrier, so that it, it can um, get some um, food through the ketones. But when you're in serious ketosis, you're not a happy camper. Uh, the side effects are huge: nausea, vomiting, um, and bad um, breath, bad, terrible breath, um, and uh, and just constipation like crazy. And Atkins had to deal with all this with his patients. So he had all kinds of supplements and stuff to give him in these situations. Um, really bad um, uric acid stones. Um, so gout would flare a lot. I see. I've had so many patients come to me with gout when they're on an Atkins diet. Mm. Um, and kidney stones, like crazy. Kidney stones, it's just not a natural way. Our bodies are not very good at handling acid. Uh, not like a carnivore. So a carnivore is perfectly created. You could put a, a lion on a ketotic uh, diet and they'd do fine. But, um, but they don't need the fiber. They've got a short intestinal tract. They don't need vitamin C. They don't need uh, any of these things. But um, a plant-based eater, like we are designed to be, like a frugivore, like a monkey, is meant to be eating fruits. And that's what our mouth, that's what our digestive tract, we have amylase in our saliva. You go on and on and on. We are made to be eating these foods that are our primary 
uh, to make us live a healthy life. The ketosis is an emergency situation should there be a famine or a freeze and we can't get our food. But when food's a plenty, we're eating fruit. That's mm-hmm. what we're supposed to be doing. When you look at the fruitarians, like whether it's somebody like Foley Raw Christina, who's a mutual friend of ours, or Michael Arnstein, or some of these people out there that, that you know, I know these people, they're like vibrating health. <laughs> they they have vibrating. like their yeah. skin looks amazing. Yeah. They have positive energy. Right. You know, they look you in the eye. They're very present. There's something about that lifestyle that seems to really agree with the people that ad- adapt it. Um, and they become so passionate about it. Mm-hmm. It's almost, be, you know, it's like they're just exuding enthusiasm for this lifestyle. Um, but what is like, you know, I've never been a fruitarian. I've never gone that far down, you know, down the road that way. I mean, what is your opinion on kind of the long-term impacts of, of eating that way? Yeah, there's, there's I mean, no, do you suggest that for your patients? No, or? I, don't, I don't suggest it. I, I don't suggest it because, you know, I don't suggest anything where I don't have good data to support it. Uh, my gut feeling is it's very healthy, but I, I just don't have data to support it. People mm-hmm. say, well, where's the protein come from? Uh, and there's amino acids in fruit. And the other thing you got to understand is our body recycles our amino acids very effectively. So we break down uh, our protein into amino acids and then retake them up and reuse them again. So we have a built-in amino acid store. Um, and the ones that I've met are just, you know, top of the sports amino acid. They don't care about, they don't read, they're never taking they don't supplements. Think about it. Yeah, they no, don't do anything. They don't. Know? They're just eating their bananas and doing great. And so um, I think there's something real to it. I don't know that I'm, you know, I need more science before I would give it to my patients. But um, I told uh, Christina I'm, I'm willing to give it a shot. So she's going to put me on her. Uh, oh, you're going to do it. I'm going to do her uh, raw 21 day diet. And it's weird for me because I, I say I don't ever count protein or think about protein, but I eat a lot of beans. Mm-hmm. Um, I love beans. Uh, beans and rice are like my go-to meal. And I think someone who's really, I've really, you know, of all the gurus that have come out on plant-based dieting, I think I've probably tended towards, more towards McDougal in a starch-based diet. I really feel like we are starch eaters and, and do very well on starch diets, and that's what I really get my patients to do. Um, but I, I could see the benefit with the um, with the raw food diet. I just, I'd like to prove it to myself and get them more, more studies before I did it with patients. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So let's talk about the book, man. Mm-hmm. How, how close are you to being well, it's, done? It is done. Oh, Thank it's done. God. Yeah, that was a, uh, <laughs> I don't want to ever do it again. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Oh man. my God. Am I, um, I mean, you just lived in the research I for lived in the research. how many years have you been working on it? Three years. Uh huh. Yeah. And is um, it going to, is it called, what's it called? The protein myth? It's called the proteinaholic, a proteinaholic. Our obsession with protein, how it's killing us. Uh huh. Yeah. My general point, like, I don't want to get into reductionist scientists. I don't want to be a fear monger. Actually, I probably should be a fear monger because we're dying. Sell more books. <laughs> I, I, I want to be a fear monger because, you know, we're the most unhealthy people in the world and when no one fears their double cheeseburger. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I started this, you know, years ago, I was talking with, uh, my editor at Harper one, Gideon Weil, and he's like, what is the central problem out there? And he was, he was great with me because I just had this general view. Well, people are eating like crap. That's the, you know, they're not eating enough, uh, fruit, vegetables, nuts, beans, and seeds. Yeah. He's like, that's too general. Why mm-hmm. aren't they eating that? And it kind of gelled down. I was like, you know what? I, I just started getting this view of every patient that comes in my office and I go over their diet. What diets have you done before? Well, I've done Atkins. I've done South Beach. I've done Zone. Currently on Atkins right now. So you believe in high protein mm-hmm. diets? Yes. Then why are you sitting in my office? You know? And so that's when he really got me thinking, man, maybe it's the protein. It's this idea. And I hate this reduction of science. I really do. But the only way I'm going to fight the reduction of science is, is to become a reductionist uh-huh. myself and prove it wrong. And so I did research. I mean, I think there's a thousand papers in, referenced in the articles. And um, I really go into really good depth tying them all together. So it's not like, oh, here's one PubMed article that says this. It's like, let's look at all these together. Let's look at the good and the bad. And uh, show you that this desire to get huge amounts of protein is completely unnecessary and that carbs are certainly not bad for you. Mm -hmm. So that's the basic thesis of the book. Basic thesis, yeah. Right. And so do you have case studies throughout that or is it like your own experience or is it just, is it very research based or? It's very, I start out with kind of my story, you know, talking a lot about what we've just talked here about. Like, Right. Well, let's recap that again. If somebody's listening to this and they haven't gone back and listened to the first time that we chatted. Yeah. I mean, I was, you know, here I was. Was, you know, go to medical school, study everything you could ever want to know about a cell, but never once studied nutrition, get into um, residency, 
start developing a belly, go on the Atkins diet and get sick, think, eh, forget it, I'm just going to be a busy surgeon, get into practice and, you know, I'm seeing people with cancer and, and diabetes and heart disease and I'm treating this obesity and I'm looking at everybody's diet plan and everybody's eating the same damn thing. And it's exactly what I'm eating, you know, eggs for breakfast, Subway sandwich for lunch, chicken for dinner, hamburgers here and there. And, um, and I stop and think, God, I'm operating on people, but I'm not telling them what to eat. In fact, I wrote a book that said eat high protein Mm -hmm. and everyone's coming in, you know, well, I followed your advice. I'm eating high protein. I'm gaining back weight. And so I started to really think, gosh, this is bad. And then I got my life insurance policy because I was having a kid and my cholesterol was sky high. My liver function tests were high. I was hypertensive and they denied me for my life insurance policy. Mm. And then, of course, my friend, uh, medical doctor, was like, oh, no problem. We'll put you on Lipitor. We'll put you on a beta block. We'll put... But I knew, you know, I know what happens. You get worse and worse and worse. You're going to have a heart attack at 50, 60. And so I said, there's got to be a different way. And then I, that's when I really started studying these other cultures and how it works. And the more I studied, the more research, I said, oh, my, my patients could benefit this, not just me. Mm-hmm. The more I started incorporating my patients and, you know, totally changed my practice. Uh, mm-hmm. And now I've got, you know, the healthiest patients and... Makes me a, a, a busy doctor. Yeah, you have you're you're super active on Facebook. You write these long articles and rants, and, yeah. you know, and you share your your patients' success stories. And there's some pretty amazing like before and after pictures and 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 anecdotes about some of the people that have passed through your practice. Yeah, yeah, they're great. I mean, I have some patients that it's just been diet. Now, you know. I'm known for the surgery. My, my patients are not your typical patients. You know, they come in 400 pounds. You know, this is, these are big patients. So we do do surgery, but we I've changed the paradigm where there's diet instruction from the get-go. Some of the people decide not to do surgery. Those that do surgery definitely go and I don't really tell vegetarian or vegan. I just say I want you more plant-based. Turn, don't do what Americans do. Don't mm-hmm. let chicken be the star of the plate actually flip the plate around and I give them, we do cooking classes, we do, you know, a lot of nutrition, which my colleagues are not doing. And that has made my surgery patients so successful. Mm -hmm. So successful. But you're losing money. Yeah. Well, those ones I operate on, (laughs) but there are some that I lose money. I I saw a lady the other day, she's, uh, you know, her body mass sense is 36. She barely qualifies for surgery. She said, listen, I will pay you cash to do it. And I said, listen, I went over her diet plan. I was like, you can lose this weight easily. But I'm eating a lot of protein. That's the problem. You know, change the protein. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you saw it. I had a, a great story the other day about a, a lady comes in. She wants, um, she's from Ghana and she wants surgery. And she's been living in the United States for 10 years. And at that time, she's gotten really heavy. And she's very educated. She's an engineer. And she's doing everything. She comes in. She's on weight loss pills. And she's currently on Atkins. She's done Atkins several times. She's done South Beach. She's done um, Zone, done all these diets. And so we're going over her diet plan. What do you eat for breakfast? Eggs. What do you eat for lunch? Chicken. I just have a chicken breast. Mm -hmm. What do you eat for dinner? And and it's going on. I'm like, okay, so you obviously believe in all this protein and everything. Why do you think it's failing? What's not working? She goes, well, I'm from Ghana and I've got friends from Ghana. And they come over and we have a typical Ghana meal. And I think that's what's making me gain weight because it's too many carbs. I'm like, what is your Ghana meal? She's like, oh, it's really bad. It's like potatoes and sweet potatoes. And we do sweet potato stew (laughs) and we use uh, cassava and all this stuff. And I'm like, that's the best meal you've had all day. And I said, okay, well, do you ever go to Ghana? She goes, yes. I was like, okay, how many people are overweight in Ghana? Oh, nobody. I'm the biggest person when I'm there by far. All right. And when you're there, what do you eat? Well, I I eat the food that my family eats there. And? Well, you know, now that you mention it, I lose weight every time I go there. I'm like, you see my point? But sometimes it's that people are just so addicted to this idea that protein is what makes you lose weight. And so Mm -hmm. there's stuff in there filled with food that we know does not make you lose weight. We're being inundated with this message everywhere we turn. I mean, I love when you go to these conferences and you speak at these conferences and you take pictures of what the breakfast is and, and, you know, kind of like the nutritional recommendations that are being proposed by some of the doctors with whom you share the podium. Yeah. I mean, I, I was at the American Society of Bariatric Medicine. This is a society that is, it's the medical doctors dealing with weight. Again, I, you go to these meetings, not a lot of talk about diet. Everything's high protein. It's sponsored by Atkins. The chairperson of the committee is from Duke, um, Eric Westerman. And he gets money from Atkins, and he runs these high protein diets. And he put up his typical day's diet for the patients. And it was, I saw that thing, and I wanted to run up on stage and attack him. Because I can't imagine telling a patient to eat cheeseburgers and... and um, 
uh, his diet, I, I put it on my Facebook, it was just the most, anything bad you could possibly think of. It was like the, his diet that he recommends for his patients is the diet my patients come in on, mm. uh, you know, at 400 pounds. And I just think it is unbelievable disservice. What he's getting is a quick weight loss because these people are going into ketosis, but they always put it back on. They always land back up in my office. Mm. And it's sad. So if you, <clears throat> like, if you could leave... Uh, the audience with like a couple things that they could just think about that might be uh, contrary to what they might imagine about diet or a couple things that they could just implement into their life to start to make a shift? Yeah. You know, what, are, what are some of those things? Well, there was, a, there was a great study recently where they showed that if you just tell people to eat 35 grams of fiber a day and don't give them anything else more complicated, don't weigh this, don't weigh that, just eat 35 grams of fiber a day, people get really good weight loss. People that are eating tons of fiber don't really get sick. They don't get sick. They, they. Uh, I mean, it, it, you know, because it's not just the fiber; it's what the fiber is. Mm-hmm. You know, there's no fiber in the animal products. There's only fiber in the plant. Right, products. but if you forget, just forget about protein, yeah. and let's shift all of that focus that you had on protein and put it on fiber, right. and then see what would happen. Yeah, my message would be: it's almost impossible not to get enough protein, no matter what you're eating. That's number one. Number two, eating more protein will make you sick eventually. Um, and number three, eating more plants is really like finding the fountain of youth. Um, it makes you, it's not just because people say, well, I don't care if I live, you know, 10 years longer, if, you know, I have to eat that crap, the food's delicious. It's just your, your whole taste buds change. Mm-hmm. Um, That's the thing I think people miss or don't get. That they don't they, get that. They, and they can't imagine that they'll actually get to a place where they will desire or crave healthy foods. Yeah, I have patients say to me, I wish I had your willpower. To me, it's not willpower. It's not willpower for me to eat a kale salad. I crave a kale salad. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I used to crave a double cheeseburger. And you, you could change that. I could talk about how I change that with patients. But you could change the, this thought process and you could change your taste. And Everybody who goes through it, I, I get this, you know, blessing, you know, all these people online yakking about this and that, and they've never treated a patient. I get to sit across from a patient and actually see these changes. And the changes are amazing. The way people feel, the way they look, what they're doing in their life, it's, it's really rewarding. And when I think about how many people in this world could benefit if we just got rid of this idea of protein and went to a, the idea of, you know, whole foods, fruits, vegetables, beans, um, it would really change the health of the country, the health of the environment, mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and have so many other benefits out there. What, where do you come down on grains? I mean, you're kind of a McDougal guy. I love grains. Um, you know, but there's this idea that, uh, you know, today's wheat is not your grandmother's wheat. It's highly hybridized. Yeah. You know, most wheat is stripped of its nutritional value and higher in gluten than it ever has been. And we're seeing allergies and all kinds of things. So, and you have the wheat belly and the grain brain books out there that are influencing a lot of people. Yeah. It, like, you know, the wheat belly, I mean, God, that book, there's just no, the science is so bad in those books. It's just, I, and of course the lay person doesn't know how to read the science and understand that, that there's something being put over on them. Um, they did a great study recently because everybody's, such a placebo effect. Everyone now is so affected by grain. They were eating it 10 years ago without a complaint about it, but now everybody's got um, gluten um, sensitivity. So they took a group of people and three, they put them in three groups. One, they were all going give, to give them the food. Okay, They're all getting the food given to them. One group is going to be, they're all told you don't know what your gluten level is. This, this may, you may be getting a low gluten, you may be getting a high gluten, but you're all gluten sensitive. So the um, one group gets a really high gluten level. Uh, another group gets a medium gluten level. One group gets no gluten level. Absolutely no difference in the symptoms. The low gru- gluten group has the exact same symptom as the high gluten group. They're like, oh my God, I feel terrible. This gluten. So are you, are you saying that gluten is not a thing? Gluten like is a, not gl- a thing. Gluten's not, the gluten sensitivity is imagined. Absolutely imagined. Really? It's imagined. Now, what might not I mean, be I can imagined. tell you that if I eat like a lot of processed wheat, like bread or whatever, mm-hmm. that... I, I feel like I, my my the skin around my eyes inflames. Like there's a whole thing that happens. There's a I feel lousy. I get tired. There's a sensitivity to FODMAPs. You know what FODMAPs are? Fructo, mm-hmm. oligopolysaccharides. Um, a lot of the times when people are having these symptoms to different foods, it's our gut bacteria in a way. Our gut bacteria interplays with those. And, and I think that is a lot more to do with it. So these people that, so all three groups were having symptoms. 
Mm-hmm. Now, were those symptoms faking in their head? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe what they're reacting to is not the gluten, but the fact that these grains have FODMAPs, these different um, oligosaccharides, which are certain carbohydrates that their body just, their, their um, bacteria just can't handle. And that might be a big part of the problem. Mm. Um, but uh, people that have, okay, I, I get inflamed when I eat wheat. If I take you to a lab and then draw your blood and look for all the factors that show inflammation, zero will come out positive. There will be no inflammation. Unless you have SPRU, celiac disease. You actually have celiac. That's a different story. Mm -hmm. Then I will. But that's the thing about this gluten insensitivity, this gluten sensitivity that's out there right now. Everybody thinks they're in inflammation, but it doesn't show up in any of their lab. There's no lab value for gluten sensitivity. It's a symptomatology without any clinical findings in it. And it may not be the gluten. Now, the, it would be fine to just drop the grains, except that the grains are fantastic for you. So if you look at the long-term studies, grains are unbelievably good for diabetes. They're unbelievably good for heart disease, and they're a big source of our fiber as well as a lot of the B vitamins. So what we're doing is taking away this, you know, um, group of food that's actually extremely good for you. There's even studies that show that grain's good for your brain. But when we're talking about grains, I mean, you know, we're not talking about eating, you know, Triscuit crackers. No, we're not. Know? That's processed. I mean, there's a there's a difference between eating, you know, uh, you know, a processed, pasta, you know, grain based pasta, and yes. maybe you know, a really like a, an heirloom millet or something like that. Those are qualitatively very different, right? Because the processing, like, just take oatmeal for instance, because they've done a lot of studies on oatmeal. You, know, you take a steel cut a rolled oat, or if you take a quick oat or an instant oat, what they're doing is basically shucking off more of the germ fiber so that it cooks easier and it cooks quicker. But the problem is then you eat, like let's you take that instant oat meal, you eat it, you get a big blood sugar surge with a big blood sugar drop, and you're hungrier again sooner because there's less fiber in it. Um, but if you take the whole oat, um, and even if there's the same amount of fiber in it, the whole oat takes longer to break down and digest. So you're not going to get this blood sugar surge. You'll have a, a longer, slower blood sugar release, which provides energy without problems. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think most of the, the problems with with wheat are, uh, in general, probably have to do with our gut microbiome and the way we process it. How does GMO fit in that? I don't know. There may be something with GMO in that, but, boy, that, that research is hard to go through because industry is all over it. Mm-hmm. I mean, when somebody says, what should I think about GMOs? What do you, how do you respond to that generally? I generally respond that I would be careful. Mm-hmm. My general thought is it, they say it's good for you. They haven't done the studies to show that it's good for you. They just haven't. And, and it would take a lot of studies and it'd be a difficult study. But my general question is why GMO? I mean, why would you, why would you want something that you know, where they're messing with the genetic structure of the food. The other thing that bothers me about GMOs is not even the GMO. It's the result of having a GMO product, which is you're growing a huge monocultural crop. That huge monocultural crop is terrible for the environment. Mm -hmm. The soil is devoid of nutrient. Uh, And so that's just not the food I want want to put in my body. I I think we're going to find out that GMO is, is extremely bad for you. But I you know, it, I can't, I don't have the science behind it that I do with saying that meat causes diabetes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Caution. Yeah. Caution for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's not just, I mean, when you're dealing, there's all different kinds of GMOs too. Yeah, you know, like it, it, it's not one thing, but if you're it's dealing not. with, you know, sort of a strain of food that has been bred to be pestilent resistant and deal well with glyphosate. That means that it's laden with all sorts of chemicals on yeah. top of it that I mean, are in the soil and absorbed exactly. into the roots and, and all of that. So there's more, there's more going on. Right. And there was a very biased study that was done for, by Stanford looking at, um, at organics versus inorganics. And they said that there's no difference in the nutrient level. And there's been other studies that said, oh, they didn't do it right. There are differences. But this very, you know, this group that was getting money from biotech and stuff did say without a doubt the GMO group had higher pesticides. So why do you want to eat pesticide? Mm -hmm. These people are like, oh, we got to have GMOs. I don't understand it. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't want pesticides in my food. I I mean, glyphosate has just been um, labeled as a carcinogen. Uh, And... And that's just the tip of the ice cap of what's going on. I mean, you know, the, the FDA is supposed to do trials anytime there, or the USDA is supposed to do trials 
no, I'm sorry, FDA is supposed to do trials anytime a new product comes out, like a, that's a GMO, to make sure it's safe. Well, they had a GMO alfalfa come out, and the FDA just said, no, nah, let's go ahead and use it. And there weren't any testing done, so the um, Union of Concerned Scientists, the, mm-hmm. the Committee of Concerned Scientists, took this up, and they, they fought a battle, and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, yeah, the FDA could do whatever they want. The head of the FDA that was pushing this used to work for Monsanto. Right. <laughs> right. Clarence Thomas used to work for Monsanto. I mean, it's just such a, I mean, it's like people say, oh, this is conspiracy theorists. It's so in your face. It's beyond conspiracy. It's obvious. And we're relying as consumers on these regulatory bodies to be holding out for our, our best interest. Right. And know? it's, and it's in there. I mean, it's in the USDA bylaws that they have to look out both for the safety of the consumer, but also for the safety of the productivity of the company. Mm. And you could, you better bet when it becomes a, yeah, that really shouldn't be shouldn't part be, of the manifest. Shouldn't be part of the manifest. That should be all about the, the person and not about the company. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've really just, uh, divested ourselves of, so much control, you know, and the average consumer is just, you know, what are you supposed to do? You yeah. Know, we, we trust and rely on these organizations to basically tell us what's safe and what's not. And when you realize that they're compromised or they're heavily influenced by, you know, profit motive and, and, and business, and it's all this, you know, cabal of <laughs> r- rotating chairs, you know, from one organization to the next, it's, that's very disconcerting. Yeah, it's it's strange, but I, I tell my patients like we've been talking about science and all this time this whole time, but just try to use a little common sense. I mean, look at the food. Look at an orange. Peel an orange. It's like created for you. Tastes great. It's perfectly packaged. You know, who needs but you know better packaging than an apple? Uh, and then think about. And I have my patients um, do. Um, a journaling where they journal and have them journal. How do you feel after a meal? Mm-hmm. So they, after a, you know, a high fruit, high vegetable diet, they feel fantastic afterwards. And the more they notice how fantastic it is, the more they will instinctually go towards that food. Whereas think about how you feel when you eat a double cheeseburger. Mm-hmm. Everyone does it. Everyone feels like crap afterwards. They laugh about how they feel like crap and they go back for more. Right. And uh, I, I try to appeal to my patients on this kind of instinctual level about what do you think your body's supposed to eat? Journaling is really powerful too because most people will tell you that they eat pretty healthy. You know, like, yeah, I'm, I'm healthy. I eat pretty healthy. Yeah. But w- when you actually write down and you're honest with yourself about what you're doing, generally it tells a pretty different, pic- different picture yeah. <laughs> about what you're and doing. It hold, it and you that can be really revealing for, and empowering for somebody to go, oh my gosh, you know, I really thought I was doing this and I, I now can see. What I am doing is very different. Like I need to make that change. Yeah, it's a very powerful tool. And and they you start to notice food patterns that you might have not thought of before. You notice how you feel. You notice if you're overeating. You tend not to pick bad foods because you say, oh, I got to write that down in my journal. And Dr. Davis is going to look at it. Mm-hmm. How am I going to do it? And so, uh, and so I, I have found it a, a very big part of my practice. What do you think is the number one thing that, that holds your patients back or the people that you treat um, from grasping, you know, this idea of a healthy lifestyle trajectory or, or what is the big impediment that prevents them from taking that leap? Protein. I think it's protein. I think it's this belief that we need high doses of protein and that therefore chicken and meat are good for you. Mm-hmm. So in other words, that's preventing them from embracing a, a more plant-centric approach to their diet because they're yeah. afraid that they're going to be missing out on something that they need to survive. Yeah, look, well, I'll t- uh, you know, I use these journals and the patient will come back to me two months later. We've talked about eating more fruits, more vegetables. I've given them packets about what to do for snack time, eat an apple. And I look at their, their log and I see, you know, eggs for breakfast, beef jerky for a snack, lean chicken. And they always put lean next to the mm-hmm. chicken, which, you know, kind of nonsense. And I'm like, what happened to all the fruits and vegetables? Like, well, I was going to do it, but I mean, I thought, you know, beef jerky would be better for me than an apple because I need protein. Mm-hmm. And that's protein is it. I mean, to me, it's, that's a one big problem. It's what's driving everybody. If everybody could just relax about protein, they could start enjoying fruits and vegetables because who doesn't enjoy fruits? Mm-hmm. Um, they taste great. I, you know, I told there, that in that epic trial I talked about earlier, uh, one big part of it is they studied 500,000 people for 12 years looking at their diets and looking at weight gain, they definitely saw an increase in weight with meat eaters. Most specifically, the most weight was gained with chicken eaters. Mm. Chicken was the biggest cause of weight gain. I tell my patients that, and they're in shock because to them, 
Chicken is the health food. That's the lean alternative. That's the lean alternative. That's but it's not as food. lean as people think. It's not as lean as people think. And we eat more chicken than any other country in the world. How's it working for us? Use yeah, common sense. Yeah. Well, I, it, we probably overeat it because we think it's healthier, so, it's so healthy. then we eat more of it, right? right? Yeah. All right, last question for sure. you. If you were, uh, if you woke up and suddenly you had been appointed to be Surgeon General, mm -hmm. what kind of changes are you making? Oh, man, I would be so happy. Um, <laughs> I would be so happy. I, there would be, there would be so many things that I want to do. Some of them I'm working on right now, uh, but there would have to be nutrition education and medical school classrooms. I would work very hard in nutritional education in high school and, and, uh, junior high and right from the get go, including growing, um, foods and farming. Um, I would do my, I mean, the farm bill would be something I would go crazy on. Mm -hmm. Ending subsidies, subsidies. To, uh, to agribusinesses, supporting small farmers. Um, I would be, you know, working very hard at, at farmers that do multicultural crops instead of monocultural crops. So we have a more dependable food source that's richer in environments. Um, I would be very big into different cities doing um, community farming and community uh, growth projects like that. Um, I'm um, working right now on our hospital system, changing the food in hospital systems. I mean, is it, how crazy is it when you go into a hospital and there's a McDonald's? Mm -hmm. That just, just drives me up the wall. And, and it sends a very important message that, uh, you know, Wendell Berry said we live in a, in a uh, you know, the problem with the system we live in is we live in a food system that doesn't care about health and a health system that doesn't care about food. And as a surgeon general, that would be my, my, my topic, try to make the health system concerned about food and the food system concerned mm -hmm. about health. And what about these regulatory bodies, the FDA, the USDA? Yeah, I mean, the USDA needs to split where it's just being concerned with health or the FDA just just needs to be concerned with health. Lobbyists need to be taken. I mean, this is a this goes into a much deeper, you know, now we're getting into politics. But yeah, well, it's campaign finance, yeah, the whole way the system operates. Yeah, I mean, campaign finance reform and term limitations and stuff like that. So you don't get these guys that are in there that are paid by big business. I mean, we've got Republicans. Republicans saying that there's no such thing as global warming. It's just, it's so anti-intellectual and they get away with it and they get away with it because they get paid for it. And mm -hmm. so there would have to be so much changes, but I think education would be uh, the big starting the point. focus for you. Yeah. Good, man. I think we did it. <laughs> That's crazy. How do you I feel, feel like we could go on forever sometimes. We could. This, right? I mean, you could, like, if you lived here, you'd be on the show all the time. Yeah, man. I'd love to. Hey, I'd so, love to live here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, we got a room for you, man. Yeah, I might move. <laughs> you, have a, you have a room for a Great Dane and uh, two uh, Screaming Daughters? We, we, we do, actually. <laughs> we, do. we got plenty of room. Yeah. Come anytime, yeah. man. Yeah. I um, loved it. Yeah, this is great. Thank you. So the book is coming out. Is it coming out in the fall in October? It's coming out in October. October. That's yeah, great, man. Proteinaholic. Exciting. Yeah, and they're doing pre-sales now on Amazon and another building. Oh, it's already up on Amazon. It's already up on Amazon. All right, man. Building. Yeah. Well, everybody go pre-order the book. Check it out. Yeah. Use the Amazon banner ad at ritual.com so we can both wet our beaks on this. That, that sounds and support, good. Support the good Dr. Garth. Um, are you training for anything right now? I am going to start, um, I'm worried about book tours and stuff like that, so I didn't mm -hmm. want to get too into training, uh, but I'm going to do another Ironman. I got my eye on uh, November 16, uh, uh, November 2016. Cool. Yeah. And are you going to be doing a big book tour? Yeah, I think fall? I am going to be doing oh, quite nice, a bit of one. Man. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. I'm excited for you. Yeah, go and preach the word. Out. Excellent, man. Right on. Well, uh, best way to connect with you, uh, for those that, that are digging on Garth, is uh, the door just mysteriously open. <laughs> yeah, right. um, Facebook's probably the best best place, right? That's yeah, I'm on Facebook and Twitter, but Facebook, Dr. Garth on Facebook uh -huh. is uh, where I do most of, you know, I'll print, lo you know, recent articles and things like that and pictures of my patients and stuff. And you're Dr. Garth Davis on Twitter? Yes. Yeah, and the website is? TheDavisClinic.com. That's more for patients right. than when I have weight loss surgery. In Houston. So, yeah. all right, man. Thanks for coming by. Thanks for having me. Right on. All right. Peace. Peace out. Plants.